Good evening and welcome to this very special event tonight with Professor Ron McCallum AO in conversation about his memoir, Born at the Right Time. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from where we gather all over Australia, including the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and the Gadigal people of the Oyora Nation from where we are broadcasting tonight. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples present today. My name is Leanne Sajadi, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Vision Australia Library. We are a national public library service serving people who are blind, have low vision or a print disability. We welcome many of our members here tonight, as well as Vision Australia staff and volunteers and friends of our community. We've had a big year at the Vision Australia Library, completing a major move to a new platform in November. So if it's been some time since you've connected with us, we invite you to get in touch and explore our new website and app. We are really looking forward to the coming year to extending our service um, it, to you with expanded content, new initiatives such as this for our members um, and connecting our members with readers all across the country. We also take seriously our role uh, in highlighting publications which celebrate the diverse stories of the blind and low vision community, um, such as Born at the Right Time, which we're very proud to have in our library, now available in DAISY format. Tonight's conversation will be hosted by Stella Glory, who many of you will be familiar with from the Vision Australia program, Talking Vision. This event is being recorded and will be made available on the Vision Australia website. A link to the recording will also be sent to attendees this week. Through the evening, Stella will invite you to share your questions and comments, which you can do through the Zoom or chat, sorry, through the chat um, or the Q&A function through Zoom. Uh, if you're using Zoom with a screen reader, you can access the chat function using Alt-H. Please be aware that your comments and questions will be visible to all attendees tonight. Inappropriate comments will not be tolerated and may result in removal from the webinar. If you prefer to send your questions by email, you can do so to library at visionaustralia.org. While we will do our best to accommodate your questions, there really is so much we could do to discuss with Ron in this short hour, so we do apologise if we're not able to reach your question. It's now my pleasure to introduce Stella and welcome Ron McCallum. Thank you so much, Leanne. And yes, don't forget to uh, send your question in and it's a great honour to be here. Now, I am in the radio, one of the radio studios here at Vision Australia and behind me is a sign that says libraries change lives. And now on with the interview, it is my great pleasure to introduce Ron McCallum, AO, who is a Professor of Law at the University of Sydney. He's the first totally blind person to be appointed to a full professorship at any university in Australia. He has been Chair of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in Geneva. He's received a Centenary Medal for his work and was the 2011 Senior Australian of the Year. Please, well, I want to say please welcome Ron McCallum, but do we have any idea of how many people we've got in the audience, Leanne? I wonder if you can take, tell us. She'll get back to us on that. Hello, Ron, and thank you so much for your time this evening. And we've got 90 people currently tuning in, and I think that number is growing. Hello, Ron, and thank you and welcome. Hello, Stella. Hello, Leanne. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here on this webinar, and I can just imagine you in the Vision Australia studio because I've been there. I remember Stephen Jolly showing me that studio. Well, I'm glad you dropped his name in so quickly because I have a feeling he's in the audience right now. I think we've uh, known each other since preschool. Yes. Yes, there you a are. A long time. So tonight we are going to be talking about your book, your memoir, Born at the Right Time, um, out by Alan and Unwin, and it is currently in the Vision Australia Library. Now, in the audience, there will be many people who are blind or have low vision. 
So they will have quite specific questions and I will be representing, as an interviewer, my job is to represent the audience. And I think they're going to have questions about maybe around the writing process as a blind person and your career. And perhaps for non-blind people, this might be their first experience of hearing a blind man talk or, or meeting a blind person. So it's going to be a multifaceted uh, interview. We are going to kick off proceedings with a reading of your book. Do you want to set the scene a little bit for the reading we're about to hear, Ron? Certainly. Let me say that Bill James reads the book beautifully. And we're going to look at the beginning of Chapter 9, um, where I met Mary Crock and fell in love with her. She's sitting along here and we married and we've been married for nearly 35 years. So this begins with me talking about my limited experiences with women. Quite interesting, actually. Chapter 9. Losing my beloved mother and falling in love with Mary. From what I have so far written, it will be obvious that my knowledge and experiences with women had been quite limited. Attending special schools, then an all-boys school, having no sisters, and my family circumstances all played their part. My decision to become a legal academic, when my only technology was tape recorders, meant that my work took up much of my time. I had very few moments free for nurturing relationships. The speed and intensity of my courtship and marriage to Mary Crock turned me inside out and upside down. From being a somewhat inexperienced man, I began a relationship with Mary in August 1985. Within nine months we were married and within two years we were parents. I first met Mary on a Saturday evening, the 18th of August 1984, at a dinner party hosted by my colleague and friend Sue McNichol, with whom I taught evidence at Monash. Later, Mary told me that she had met Sue that afternoon and Sue had said that she had too many men and not enough women to grace her table. She asked Mary to come along and make up the numbers. The dinner was a fine one, with the guests predominantly lawyers and academics. However, Sue's husband Andrew had a stomach bug, so he spent most of the evening in bed. Father Frank Brennan, who Mary and I both happened to know before knowing each other, was also in attendance. At some time towards midnight, I found the conversation around me to be a little dull. Then I heard a beautiful, mellow voice from across the table. When the moment proved opportune, I walked around and introduced myself to Mary. We said hello and exchanged names, and Mary then said, You are obviously an RLF child. I asked her what she meant, and she explained that, from her observations, I was most probably born premature and had suffered from retrolental fibroplasia. I said, Well, smarty pants, how come you know all about RLF? Mary then explained that her father was Professor Gerard Crock, Australia's first full professor of ophthalmology. When she took Thanks, my arm to find a seat, it was instantly clear to me that Mary had experience being in the company of blind people because her approach was relaxed and capable. That was charming. So um, it's, it's amazing how uh, seemingly small, you know, how fate sometimes intervenes in our lives. Absolutely. If Mary had not been walking across the campus of Melbourne University at that very time that Sue came out, or if Sue had met another young woman and invited her instead, yes. So tell us why you asked us to play that particular excerpt from your memoir. I think because that's the halfway point in the memoir, um, before that, it was, well, I say before Croc, BC. Um, uh, that was my early life. And then for the last 35 years, the second half of the life has been marriage and parenting with Mary. And so it, it is a very special part of my life. In many ways, I think when you live a single life, you're often on the periphery of society. Once you become married and a parent, 
you move into mainstream. And so this was a big change, like a, um, a, from a chrysalis to a butterfly, to use a methodology. Perhaps it shouldn't be that way, and perhaps we shouldn't regard single people and people with different backgrounds on the periphery, but I think society still does. And it must have been doubly so for you as a blind person. Oh, because yes. which you talk about in the memoir that, um, and then it was almost like this entryway into mainstream life for you. Yeah, and many of my sisters and brothers with disabilities, and we know that, that we're doing this on the 2nd of December. Tomorrow is International Day of People with Disability. Many of my sisters and brothers don't have the opportunity to partner or to parent. And these came within a rush. You know, uh, We were engaged six weeks after our going out in 1985 and then we were married some months later and then parents and it all went very quickly. If there's one thing that I have learned over the past six years from hosting Talking Vision and the number of blind people that and people with low vision that I've been speaking to over the years, finding someone to love, partnering up is absolutely a concern because it also there's the opportunity and there's also the stigma around disabilities which I imagine can impact on someone's confidence. I, I'm, I'm sure that there is still an issue of disability stigma. I didn't feel any stigma but I think it's, it's just lack of opportunities um, and I was involved teaching and using tape recorders which took up time and so I didn't really meet people beyond my students. And I certainly wasn't going to have a relationship with a student, heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. And um, they wouldn't have been interested in anyway, <laughs> all young. <laughs> well, you know. Um, so it was also a rather bittersweet time for you. So you met Mary, but at the same time, your mother died and you had a very close relationship with your uh, mother. In fact, the, there's there's three women, very pivotal women in your life. Can we talk a little bit about your relationship with your... Actually, before we do that, what I will do is ask, why is the book called Born at the Right Time? And also, what made you decide to write your memoir? It's called Born at the Right Time because I think I was. Um, I was born 1948 and young enough to take advantage of the extraordinary changes in technology with computers and uh, scanners so that I can read. I'm one of the first blind people on the planet in the history of our world who can read independent of Braille. Um, and that right belongs to we blind people who live mainly in the developed world. Um, I had friends when I was growing up who were blinded in World War I and World War II and they missed out on this technology. So I think I was born at the right time. I couldn't have done all the things I've done without the technology. If people with vision think that computers have altered their lives, nothing compared to what they've done to we blind people or we deaf people, those of us with sensory problems. I wrote the book, I think perhaps, um, I remember being interviewed when I was elected to the UN Committee on the Rights of People with Disability by Eleanor Hall for what it was called, the Midday, the, the show on the ABC. Yeah, Midday, the Moon, World Today. World Today. And I'm walking around a New York apartment where I'd just been elected. And I think Eleanor said to me, you know, you ought to write a book. And I thought, I'd like to tell my story. I think we all want to tell our story. We all want to cherish perhaps what we think is unique. Wanted to write it for the children. Um, and then Eleanor Unwin became interested and, and particularly Richard Walsh, who said, this is a fascinating love story. And in a sense, he was right. Yeah, we were talking about that before. It is a love story. And who's it a love story to? Is it to Mary? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> clearly. I mean, you, you mentioned my mum and you mentioned Lois story and that they're the three people whom the, the book is, is dedicated to. But, you know, Mary, Mary has really sent the stage. Now, there's two parts to my question. 
I'm going to start at the beginning in uh, post-war suburban Melbourne. What was Melbourne like then, or indeed the rest of Australia? Melbourne. And what, and what was the world like for a young blind child in post-war suburban Melbourne? Well, Melbourne was a much smaller city. I think it had less than or only just a million people. Uh, it didn't have the huge amount of traffic. A lot of people didn't own cars. Uh, we didn't have a telephone. It was nothing unusual. Um, and uh, I remember we didn't have a washing machine. Again, that wasn't unusual. In the early 50s, we had a, a, a gas copper. You know, I can remember stirring the clothes with a big stick with my mum. Um, what it was like for blind people, radio wasn't what it is today. There were no AM and PM news broadcasts. Radio was very staid, and so it was very hard for blind children to get an understanding of the world. And it was only with friends like Peter Walsh and others that I started listening to shortwave radio and could get the BBC and Voice of America and Beijing and all the other stations. And their news broadcasts were much more sophisticated than Australian broadcasts. I, I remember the, the crackle of shortwave. That no one does, has shortwave anymore. It's all on the internet. But if you like, shortwave radio was my internet. Now, the reason I was asking those questions, I was talking to a, a younger, much younger reader the other day, and uh, she was quite amazed at the idea that not everyone, everyone's house had a telephone and that there were particular ways of um, how people did the washing and the housework, those type of things. So I just wanted to set the scene for people. What about education and career expectations for blind children or blind people? Well, uh, in 1953, when I was four and a half or whatever, it was my first uh, interaction with what is now Vision Australia at the Royal Victorian Institute for the Blind in the Melbourne suburb of Paran. In those days, opportunities for we blind were much more limited than today. Um, because we couldn't access the printed word, there weren't even tape recorders then. I saw my first wire recorder in 1956. And so you were either a professional, and they were usually people who'd been blinded during World War II, but had been educated beforehand. Or you ended up doing factory work. And across our playground, there was a wire fence, and I can still feel the wire in my fingers, um, was the factory. And that was the sheltered workshop where blind people made baskets and brooms. And before the days of the ubiquitous plastic bag, and to use an old fashioned term, for housewives, it was a badge of honor to have a basket or indeed a bassinet made by the blind. You were doing your bit. So yeah, I, uh, prospects were not great. You were threatened by a teacher. He said that that's where you would wind up. It was a she, yes. That's right. I was, <laughs> I was a woman. Oh. I, was, I was six. Um, as if you read the book, there was domestic violence going on in my house. Um, I was being bullied at school and I thought, gosh, life isn't looking too good. Um, and my kindergarten teacher, Evelyn Maguire, sat me on her lap and said, do not worry, you will never end up there. Aww. Evelyn, who passed away a, a few years ago, actually read to me at university. It's not often your kinder teacher takes the time to read to you at university. There seems to be all these wonderful women in your life, but there were men as well. There were men too. I'm yeah, amazed there were. at the, the sympathy that are given to blind people and, and the, the time people spent. Um, I think it helps if you're articulate and outgoing and open. Uh, I think the gods smiled on me. Yeah. Um, so you were, you were, you actually went to boarding school, but just during the week. But then, so tell us about that and how old you were when you went, were, because your mother, like, you had a very close relationship with her. But when you, uh, when she took you there, you didn't actually realise that she was going to go and leave you oh, there. No, I was a very articulate four and a half year old and she made my clothes. I had this wonderful hand sewn shirt and I was sent to a room with other children and then I asked where my mum was and they said, oh, she'll pick you up on Friday. I still remember being upset. I think they thought 
that if if she said goodbye there'd be all sorts of tears uh, there wouldn't have been i like bookending things in life hellos and goodbyes are very important um, and i always think um, about the first and last sentences or paragraphs of the lecture i'm going to give so they're very important bookends yeah look it was it was sort of strange um being in blind schools and then i went to st paul's blind school they, they come they tend to be very gossipy places it's a bit like an israeli kibbutz uh, you see everyone else in their underwear and there's no secrets um, is that at, at the boarding school at the boarding school yeah. Yeah. yeah and when you went to st paul's was that a boarding school as yes. well yes. yeah so thing. things kind of changed when you did go to st paul's and we were talking before that they were men in your life was that where father frank Brennan was, so he oh, no. came later. No, he came much later. Um, no, I was still, I left St. Paul's at 14. Um, and so there weren't really many men in my life in that sense. And then I went to an ordinary school and I recount that in my book. The first time I saw a, a teacher strap boys, I was in this class of 50, 14 year olds, a sweaty socks, overripe bananas in lunch boxes. And I got up when this teacher started strapping kids and he came up and he said, what are you getting up for? And I said, this is my first day to real school. And uh, he said, I'd never hit a blind child. I said, why are you doing it? He said, you've got to, he said, you, you've got to learn about school. Um, you've got to show who's boss. Um, this wouldn't be allowed these days, but I'm talking, you know, 1963, it's at 50 something years ago. But I had a good education there and it got me to university. I was happier at university where you work at your own pace. I didn't see the point in having long periods of mathematical study. I wasn't particularly interested and I couldn't work out why, why they were making me do it. So a lawyer doesn't really have to know much about maths? Well, I think they should. I'm just yeah. a bit of a maverick. <laughs> yeah. And it's really interesting hearing you talk in those tiny, like the minutiae of life. And it's, it's amazing how our brains remember these seemingly little things but they're, they're kind of pivotal like you were saying that you know you you can still feel the um the yeah. wire between where it you know between the schools and you can there's a beautiful scene where your mother is reading to you just before you're going to canada so i can smell the sea i'm sitting in this uh, fj or eh holden <laughs> and uh, near Brighton Beach, if you know Brighton Beach in Melbourne, and the sea is wafting through on this Saturday afternoon as she's reading. I'll start crying in a minute. Um, yeah. Uh, That's what makes you a good uh, mem memoirist. Well, I think. Well, you, you were asking me how, do, how, do I, how did I write the book? And first of all, I used JAWS, which many of my blind colleagues will know, the, the speech program for typing on computers. So I, I typed. And I wrote four drafts. I found that it took a while for the memories to come back. And once you've, you've written a passage, and it was over eight years, and I would be then busy with law school. Then I'd come back, and I think I should try and write a bit more. And often it was when I got memories of difficult times in my early life that I was able to lay some ghosts to rest. Um, I ended so up with a. Can we ask years. about those ghosts? Well, or can I ask about well, those ghosts? Well, well yeah, it's, it's in the book, so it's not, I'm, I'm not going to reveal yeah. anything. But basically, my father um, didn't relate to me. I, I think, in due to alcoholism and particularly post traumatic stress, I think he saw my birth as uh, affecting his manhood. I, I don't know how to articulate that. I don't remember him picking me up. Um, he was violent towards my mother on occasions after alcohol. So I really didn't really get on with my father at all. We didn't really communicate much. And in some ways I felt a bit lesser. Um, now I realize he was very sick and, and I think had mental illness, post-traumatic stress and goodness knows what else. Uh, now I think back about it, but yeah, I remember it being, being awkward and I had to learn to survive. And I think I remember realizing that whatever it took, I was going to survive. And what did you leave out? I think I probably left out 
a lot more about my security of people whom I think had given me a hard time or I didn't like. There's no point in railing in a book about someone whom you had a bad encounter with. I think I left out um, some of the awkwardness and shallowness of adolescence, um, which we all have uh, in our brains. And I, I didn't see this book as being a, a, a full frontal confession. And in uh, my three and a half decade marriage to Mary, um, I didn't go into all the details of, of ups and downs in life. Uh, we're both professional people with grown up children. And so there's an element of reticence, but within those limitations, I tried to portray as fairly as I could um, what my life was like. But when, it, when you're dealing with living people, you've got to have some reticence. Yeah. Now, before I forget, I'd really like to talk about your mum. Can you tell us a little bit about what, your, you know, what type of person your mother was? She was very determined. She had me when she was 40. And in some ways, she was a bit like a grandmother as much as a mother. And she had known blind people beforehand. Um, and again, I say it in the book, and I didn't know this uh, until I was a dad myself, um, but she'd had an illegitimate child when she was about 20. In fact, I remember meeting him and, and her family had adopted this child and she'd been sent away to be a nanny to other people's children, unbelievably cruel. And so she met my father or, and I, it's hard to speculate on why your parents got together, but uh, I think she wanted children and this was one vehicle. Um, and so she had we three boys. Um, she had a tough life and she instilled it in me that the world owed me nothing and that I had to learn to live in that world um, full of people that weren't disabled. And I had to learn to survive and be a good human being. And on, on the, the last day I saw her in hospital, she said, I've done my best. And I said, I think you really have. And anyways, I was to, uh, Mary was going to come and meet her the day she died on a Sunday. And uh, in, in some ways it, it may sound a bit trite. Um, they never met because on, on the day that the meeting, my mother died, um, but it was almost like a handing over um, by a mother of a son to a wife. It was quite um, extraordinary. I don't think it sounds tried at all. I think it's well, It's a very beautiful. special central, central yeah. part of my life. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so you say your mother was tough, but in the book she doesn't, she, she doesn't come across like she might be uh, resilient but she came across as very caring and loving woman. Oh, yeah, very caring. She had to, to bring up three boisterous boys with a husband who had been violent. I, I think perhaps the better word might be firm. She was very firm in her principle and views. Uh, uh, and, and had to instill in me um, that if I was going to survive, I had to have these techniques. Now we were talking about, we want to talk about your career and I'm like, what was, and I was actually listening to one of your TED talks and uh, you talked about, you know, all the people that have helped you over the years to achieve what you have achieved and that in 1990, you had 18 miles of tape that, of, of reading Tape, to you. tape recorders were my great friends and from high school, but particularly from law school onwards, the only way I could store legal decisions and textbooks was by having them read onto tape. And people said, well, why did you spend all that time? I said, in, 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 even in 1975, I didn't anticipate the internet and I didn't anticipate uh, the personal computer that we have today. Um, and so if I wanted to be an academic, I had to work 12 hours a day and I had to find friends who would read um, legal decisions to me. And I found my students would all come up and help me read. Um, the Victorian Ombudsman, as you're in Victoria, Deborah Glass, um, used to read to me. Retired Judge Marshall used to read to me. 
um, lots of other people, students who are now judges or senior lawyers. And prisoners. And yes, in Canada. I love that story. Well, I, I, they asked me in Canada, would I go and, and work in a prison of an evening uh, near the Queen's University? And, and prisoners wanted what I wanted. They wanted someone to listen to, 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 to listen to them. You know, you can tell when you, you're with somebody whether or not they're interested. And they wanted one-on-one -on -one conversations. And it taught me a lot about deep listening that I used later on in the United Nations and in life. And the students were going away for the summer and I needed help. So I gave them a tape recorder and they said, I will read to you. We're not going anywhere. And uh, I used to call them my boys. They were the 10 plus club. They were guys who had been in for 10 years or more. And one, I, 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 I haven't written about this in my book, but I said, would you spend time talking to this guy um, who was a sex offender? He'd grabbed a child, hadn't done anything. And after an hour had taken the child back but of course he was arrested and he, he was a man who had, he was simple. Um, he'd had a terrible home life, I think with violence. And I was only 24 and he would say things to me like, how do I rehabilitate myself? And I, when I came back to Canada a couple of years later, I wrote to the prison and I said, if Earl's still there, can I go and see him? So I'm there on Boxing Day and I'm in this room full of women and toddlers. I'm the only guy. And they open up the doors and you go in to see the prisoners. It's like the meeting of the salmon. And I meet Earl and Earl says, it's only you. And I said, well, I've come from Australia. He said, when I heard that I had a visitor, I thought it might be my family. Mm -hmm. I go, yeah, so I, yeah, I, I learned a lot in, in prisons. I learned uh, a lot about humanity. And, um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things in the book that uh, to make it commercially viable, and I, I have no quarrel, um, books have to be about 72,000 words. I mean, you know, you, I'm reading um, Barack Obama's book, um, A Promised Land, and it's got far too much detail, and you get cluttered in it. So when you're writing a book, you've got to think what sort of detail do people want. They don't want to know what you had for breakfast, particularly. Um, so yeah, I, I selected what I thought were, were the most interesting stories. I was really interested in what you said about deep listening, because I remember hearing that in the book as well. What, 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 can you tell us what is deep listening? And I guess that's something also that a lawyer would, would be, you know, would that would be a skill that a lawyer should develop. You've got to have patience. You've got to listen really deeply to what a person is saying. And you've also got to listen to the silences. What are they not saying? What, what are they trying to get across to you from their body language, um, from their words? Uh, and so particularly when I was on the UN committee and a couple of my sisters and brothers had not only, we had people not only with sensory disabilities, but psychosocial disabilities. And, and I would have to spend a lot of time calming people down and, and talking to my colleagues. Uh, we're in such a rushing world that we need to take time uh, to, to be patient with one another. I'm not very good at it. I, I get impatient, but that's important, yeah. Now, I've got a couple of big questions coming up. Now, uh, it's interesting what you were saying about a rushing world. Now, earlier on in your childhood, you were saying, you know, what well, were there three, three radio stations and the internet, you know, wasn't around. You said the internet changed your life. Now, given that there was this sparsity of information, and now we have this glut of information. How is that for you? How, how do you find your way through all this too much information? Well, I have what? to ration, ration myself because like many blind people, I have an iPhone with its voice. And so I can spend too many hours looking at the New York Times or at Australian newspapers. And I love podcasts. I, 
I wish they'd been invented. I wish I'd had an iPhone when I was 12. I love podcasts, but it's a matter of rationing. You can actually get too involved in those things and not involved enough around around you. In fact, Mary who's sitting along here would say, oh, once she used to say to me, I married a pair of earphones. And sometimes in the middle of the night, she will feel my ears. This has nothing to do with romance. We've been married a long time. And she'll say, if you don't take those earphones out, you'll be grumpy in the morning. And I say, I'm never grumpy. <laughs> But yeah, I think, you know, you, you can actually get overwhelmed by, by, yeah. by too much information. But gee, I love having it. Uh, it's like a drug. Yeah. So what are you listening to at the moment then? I'm listening to Barack Obama's book. I'm also listening to Stephen Fry read his book on Troy to give me a break. Um, I'm listening to all sorts of podcasts, the Daily from the New York Times and Lots of BBC podcasts. Yeah. Now, we are going to invite questions from the audience. So oh, uh, get, get them out. But uh, before, so people are welcome to send a question in. And uh, in the meantime, I will ask another question. Now, no doubt you're a very high achiever, especially among people with disability and in the blindness and uh, scene, as you were calling it. Uh, you're quite well known. Are there things about yourself that you think would surprise other blind people? Oh, that's a, that's a hard one. Often I find blind people are very, very... Um, little surprising. Um, I think many um, of my blind friends didn't know that uh, for 10 years I used to go and visit the Monash daycare centre, the Monash creche, because I longed for children and I wasn't expecting to have them. Uh, and that was the very interesting part of my life. I better be very clear here that I was never left alone with children at any time. Um, it was all done very professionally. It was, I think it would be much harder these days for a person with disabilities to, to go into a daycare centre. Um, but they used to look after me and help me and I again learned deep listening with them. I, you know, Five-year-olds are very interesting people, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the truth. Um, I think many people don't know of my longing for children and, and my time at daycare, which I think made me a different sort of person. People might be surprised at that. What surprised, yeah. Well, what surprised me in the book that, you know, you've been married for a long time and you've had children for a long time, but it's almost like you're, you still look at your marriage and you still look at your children like your children has just arrived and you've only just fallen in love. You seem to have oh, yeah. this wonder and awe about it. I, I, I still do. I, I don't, I mean, I, I, there were things I was longing for, settled relationship children. Um, and I had that, that uh, amazing that it would all come true. I, I think I find it um, so unique and so extraordinary. Um, uh, when I, my, my children are all grown up in their 30s. But it, it's, I, I remember their births as of yesterday or as toddlers, or as teenagers, when they used to give me no respect at the dinner table. In fact, our, our daughter, who's a lawyer, Kate, at the age of 12, brought me the Convention on the Rights of Child and said, Dad, you are not abiding by this. I said, listen, the UN doesn't operate in this house. <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 I don't know how to, it all seems fresh. Someone said to me, perhaps you're too grateful in the book. I don't think so. I think I've been blessed. There are many of my disabled sisters and brothers, sisters and brothers with disabilities who've never had my opportunities. There's a great deal of serendipity in life and I've been blessed so far. Um, had a few problems in the last few years, but really, uh, yeah, it all seems fresh and extraordinary to me. I don't think I'll ever be tired of the freshness of the children or of Mary's affection or whatever. It all still seems new. That's fantastic. Now, we've got a couple of email questions from okay. the audience. Um, oh, here's a nice, easy one, and then I'll hit you with a hard one again. What is your favourite piece of technology? The iPhone. Yeah. Oh, I love it. 
I love it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how to explain that, but I do everything on the iPhone from reading for law school to podcasts to our, our son and daughter-in-law live in, in Los Angeles and I can just use FaceTime and talk to Daniel anytime I like. And if he's busy writing, he's a film composer, he'll say, Dad, I really need to get this score done. I say, okay, let's talk in a day or two. I find the iPhone extraordinary. Didn't believe Did, anyone could invent it. And how old were you? Oh, look, I'm not, because we often think that old people don't understand, not that I'm saying that you're old, but there's this idea, with especially around younger people, that old people cannot get or middle-aged people cannot understand technology but i think blind people you know of all ages i got the iphone wrong. when i was 63 and yeah. of course my children who'd been texting with their thumbs for years thought dad was a bit slow and so for the next week i would get up at 1am in my dressing <laughs> gown go out the back not to wake mary and practice for two hours and come back to bed i wasn't going to be beaten by these children <laughs> That's the competitiveness that's of a the, lawyer, that's, isn't that's it? Right, that's right. Like, that's the competitiveness. Right? Yeah. Even though they can see, I'm thinking, no, 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 no. I'm still going to do this, right? You know. Yeah. So speaking of a lawyer, like, uh, do you think your blindness is an influence in having heightened skill like memory? So a lot of people think that many blind people have an aptitude for music. Do you think being a blind person has given you an aptitude for being a lawyer? Well, I think it, um, a lot of people with disabilities go for law because it's all in the head. Um, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of categorizing. Um, because I couldn't write things down as I can now with computers, I had to learn to memorize everything and I learned um, mnemonic ways of memory. Memory is very important. We, we undervalue memory. You don't want to go to a doctor who has no memory of, of, of um, cases or the doctor won't be able to diagnose. The reason why doctors diagnose measles very quickly on six-year-olds is because they've seen thousands of six-year-olds with measles. Um, it's our memories that give us the knowledge of the past and allow us to make sense and shape the present and the future. So it's very important. And uh, so as a lawyer, you learn to diagnose um, all forms of intellectual endeavour are forms of classification, which in part come from memory or storage of information. Another question, Q&A. Can you please comment your, on your experiences and learnings of raising your children when they were young? For example, toddlers running off. And you talk about this in the book. And uh... Oh, look, I, I don't know that my toddlers ever ran off too much, but they, um, I remember Mary tells the story um, of seeing our eldest at three, um, kicking a toy across the living room floor saying, bloody children. And he was asked what he was doing. He said, I'm being daddy. <laughs> no, I, I, um, at times I'd get frustrated. I didn't realise that a two-year-old in diapers could frustrate me. I'd say, darling, we're going to do this. No. Um, look, I, I thought they were very solicitous to me. Um, the only thing that used to get them upset when they were 10-year-olds, when we'd be at a, uh, somewhere and people would come up and say, uh, are these your children? And I'd say, well, I haven't taken the DNA test, but I verily am of the view. Children used to find that very off-putting once they understood, you know, parenting. Yeah. Um, but now I think, I, I, I think it made our eldest almost too grown up and too responsible for me and for his brothers. I mean, when he went to his year nine camp, he was a bigger boy then. He did go up to Mary and say, now you, you are going to look after him while I'm away. Mary said, hang on, I've been married to him for years. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I'm very close to the children, but yeah, I think it has affected them, but they can probably tell tell a story. Now, uh, there are a couple of anecdotes that I would like to talk to you about that were in the book. And it is, this is my, there are two that are my favourite in this particular one. Can you tell us about when I think you were just dating Mary and uh, you were having, 
dinner. So uh, your father-in-law, future father-in-law, oh, yeah. is quite an eminent uh, ophthalmologist. Well, he was the best. He was the first professor of ophthalmology. Sadly, he's passed on. Um, and uh, he had all, I, I, I would come to dinner there because I wanted to see Mary. And we were courting and we would go out somewhere. Right? And, I, and there's all these American ophthalmologists because he always had guests and he was known around the world. Very famous man and very good to me. And uh, some American <laughs> ophthalmologist said, what, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm one of the prof's failed patients. Jerry <laughs> uh, caught up with but me. But then you put your foot in it again a bit later when he talked to you and said, yeah. maybe not say that again. He said, uh, he said I, I don't think this is a way to... He was a little bit humorous, but he was also serious. He said, I don't think this is a great way to get into the family. And I said, look, I said, Jared, I think it's the beer talking. He said, could you tell the beer? Let's <laughs> call it. <laughs> now, my, my other favourite one, which I think I have it very handily here. Uh, so Mary uh, was about to go into labour and uh, something was happening with the Hawke government. Can you oh, yeah. tell us a little bit about that? I was still using tape recorders. And in 1987, they, the Hawke government brought in a new industrial relations bill. And I said to Mary, I said, darling, I really need this. I, 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 I've got to teach. Right? And you're giving up work. I said, a very busy lady. Um, and uh, I said, listen, if, if any contraction comes, just breathe through it. I really need this bill. And she finished it just before the birth and the day after she finished the Hawke government scuttled the bill and went for its July election. I, I wasn't very popular. Uh, yeah. No. Um, so the, uh, speaking of, so in 19, I think it was in 1998, there were federal court findings were heard in regard to the Patrick waterfront dispute. Now, you're uh, an expert in industrial law or labour law. And I understand you in digested this information to go on air on the ABC radio and give your analysis of the finding. Yeah. How did you do it? Well... How did you get that information and absorb that information? Well, as soon as the decision of the High Court was released, it was put up on the net and it was put up on a legal site called Ostley, Australian Legal Information Service. And the man who started that, Graham Greenleaf, uh, then at the University of New South Wales Law School, he and I knew each other and he set up the site to make it easy for blind people. With, in those days you click through and he said, Ron, I always have you in mind that I'll make the site accessible. So I was able to, to uh, download it onto my Braille and speak or whatever, and that's, I read it through very quickly and uh, was able to, to give an analysis on, on the ABC radio. So, yeah, it was, uh, I couldn't have done that with tape recorders. This is the, the early time of, of computers in the, the, the 90s. Uh, quite extraordinary. This is what I mean by born at the right time. Uh, I couldn't have been a dad, a husband, a dean of a law school, advisor to governments and all sorts of things with, without this technology. You were also able to influence someone because they knew you personally. They knew a blind person personally and they were able to adapt yes, to you. Like they thought yes. of you when they were yes, doing it. Yes, yes, that, that, that really makes a difference, I think. And that's a, why it's important for disabled people and blind people to be in significant jobs. Um, people have asked me, you know, what's the most important thing I've done in life? Um, leaving aside Mary and the children uh, and my mum and Lois, etc., And it's teaching for 48 years. I think students who've been taught by a blind person for a semester or a year never quite feel the same about disabled people. You know, I, I taught Peter Costello many, many years. We disagree on politics, but I'm very proud of what he's done. And uh, Bill Shorten was in some of my classes. And, you know, his first job, I don't know whether he... I, I don't claim any any understanding um, or credence, but the first job he took was was sec parliamentary secretary for disabilities and children. So yeah, it's it's important that uh, 
we persons with disabilities are an example to the community that we can do things. And how do you think sighted people, so this is a two-part question, part of this question is mine and part of this has come through from an audience member. They're asking how can we increase participation in people with disabilities in professional settings but I'm wondering also on top of that what, what can sighted and non-disabled people do as part of this because I wonder is it really the responsibility of disabled people? To I, think, I think we need as people um, to be open to people from different pathways. You know, if you're a law school and you say you will only take academics who've done a postgraduate degree at Oxford, you're going to have a much narrower view than if you take people from all over in different backgrounds. Um, we must be alert to people of different backgrounds, different sexual orientation. Sometimes people say to me, um, well, how do you do this? And I say, well, let's work out how we can work it. What do you think will work in this position? So a lot of my, my, my thinking is lateral. We all need to be open to people with disabilities, particularly the people with, with mental and cognitive disabilities. Uh, we need to be open to all nations, all people, we're all the same. And I think if we opened up, we're a more open society, I think we'd have higher levels of employment by people with disability. I'm still amazed that at the age of 25, I was given a tenured job at a university when many of my sisters and brothers um, were finding it hard to maintain stable employment. Oh, the gods smiled. Mm. We're almost running out of time, but quick question about your book. Uh, it's an absolute, absolute pleasure hearing about your experiences and your book. Are there any plans to have the book published on Audible? It is available through the Vision Australia Library. It's so available, read, by, and we, we did an excerpt from Bill James, read beautifully. Um, not that I'm aware of. I think it's not a big enough sale for Audible. Mm. You can also get it as a, a Kindle book and an iBook and use the voice on the iPhone to have it read out to you in synthetic speech but it's but you can you know I've also got it on my phone from Bill James I downloaded it from VA library and you can listen to it at any time but I don't think Audible are looking for they're looking for a bigger market sadly I'm so glad that you are pleased with the Vision Australia library version it, it must be like seeing a movie, like, you know, some writers see their, their books become movies and you've, you've heard that. So, so you enjoyed listening to that? Oh, yeah. Soon it was on the library. I, you know, even though I wrote it, I, I listened to it. Oh. So, and it's like, it's like, who's this guy they're talking about? <laughs> it's like, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of, kind of strange. Can I tell one time You certainly that, can. Uh, when, when I was courting Mary, I was a bit nervous. I never really dated a woman like that before. And, uh, and after about three days, because our, our, everything moved very quickly, Mary said to me, can I say something personal to you? And I thought, oh, here goes. And she said, who cuts your nails? And I said, well, I do. I, I, she said, I think from now on, I'd like to take over cutting your nails. You, you're touching my face a lot, and they're a bit rough. Um, and no other woman had ever said to me, look, I think from now on, I'm taking over your nails. <laughs> I figured she was serious. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody has said you are an excellent man. That was oh, their comment. And brilliant. you are. Uh, Ron, it has been an absolute pleasure uh, speaking with you this evening. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Ron's book, Born at the Right Time, is published by Alan and Unwin and is available now in Daisy Audio, as already said, narrated by Bill James through the Vision Australia Library. You've already said this, Ron. It's available for purchase on Kindle, iBook or in Braille large print yes, at yes. readhowyouwant.com. That's right. I'm, I'm very lucky. Yeah. And can I quickly say hello to Dean Calder, Stephen and Vicky Jolly, um, Ron Hooper. Uh, I remember playing cricket with you and all my other friends, um, 
sorry I can't see you all as much as I'd like living in Sydney. But We did have a question from Ron Hooper earlier on. And also, before we started the interview, I said to Ron, see if you can guess the Stephen Jolly question in amongst my questions. Could you guess uh, which be, one it was? Be, what is my favourite bit of technology? No, that was no. an audience question. No, no, I'm not sure. What was his, his question? His question, well, quite a few uh, <laughs> were his questions, but it was um, it was the one about the federal court findings with the Patrick oh, right. Waterfront yes. and yes. also yes. the one about what would other people be surprised, uh, other blind people would be surprised to know about you. He knows too much about me. Um, you know, as I say, we were, we were raised in the, the kibbutz of St. Paul's school in our underwear or whatever is preschool or whatever, <laughs> whatever the, the rule is. So a reminder that you can visit the new Vision Australia Library. We hope to host events like this in the future. And uh, we'd also appreciate you filling in the short survey that you will be directed to when you close the webinar. Thank you everyone for participating tonight and our participants uh, also like to have a big shout out for to Leanne who uh, was you know she did so much work on this and also to shout out to my colleague Rebecca as well who's in Sydney and of course to you thank you so much Ron and it's a good evening from us. Good evening thank you bye bye all. Vision Australia. Blindness. Low vision. Opportunity. Vision Australia logo. Three navy blue ovals linked together diagonally within a bright yellow rectangle.